Good afternoon, and welcome to The Brothers War. I knew from the moment I started doing the regular series that I did not do the antebellum years justice. What first gave it away was that I had gone out of my way not to mention William Lloyd Garrison. I kept telling myself I would get back to it as a biography episode, but as the months went on and my enthusiasm waned, I couldn't bring myself to it. Fast forward to about two months ago, and I want to restart my channel, and the biography of William Lloyd Garrison was an obvious choice. But I didn't know much about him except he was an abolitionist who wanted the slave states to secede, so I check out a biography from my local library and start notes on him. Turns out, I'd pretty heavily deranged the course of my channel. William Lloyd Garrison was too interesting, his beliefs were too interesting, I had to give some kind of background about the history of the abolitionist movement. I bought some books on the subject and started work when, to my amazement, the rabbit hole went down further. The genesis of the abolitionist movement was actually Nat Turner's revolt and Walker's appeal. So I set my abolitionist notes aside and bought books about the revolt and found a copy of the appeal online. I wrote copious notes on it and then sat down to write the episode and it occurred to me, you know, this isn't really the best jumping off point either. I should go further back in history, start with the revolution, but I spent too much money on books and I've really got to get an episode out. So today we will talk about Nat Turner's Rebellion. This episode is largely derived from Herbert Apthicker's incredibly detailed 1966 study, and he states that the Turner Rebellion was, quote, the extra drop of water that overflows a cup. It was the precipitated pebble that causes ripples in a pond. And he lists six major catalysts to the rebellion. The first is an economic depression gripping the South, particularly in the 1820s. There had been a bumper crop of cotton in the 19-teens, which caused the price to rise, but then the demand was satisfied, so supply went up and the price dropped again, and demand had not driven the price back up yet by the 1830s. The price was still down 55%. The depletion of Virginia's soil from exhaustive cultivation of non-native crops also played a factor in the low productivity of the time. Since the demand for cotton is low, the demand for slaves to grow that cotton is low, which was a disaster for Virginia, the largest slave market in the country. The price was only just barely starting to come back in 1830 for slaves and in 1831 for cotton. Because the demand for slaves was so low, this brings us to our second point, the demographic disruption of Virginia generally, and of Southampton County in particular. Since the Lower South is in depression, slaves aren't being exported there, so there's suddenly a lot of slaves in Virginia. The relative populations of both enslaved and free black people skyrocketed. Third, over the 1820s and 1830s, there's increasing anti-slavery activism in Britain, largely abolishing the slave trade, but not the practice, and slavery is being abolished in Latin America throughout the period. Mexico, Peru, and Gran Colombia in 1821, Chile in 1822, Central America in 1824 as the Bolivarian Revolution sweep through South America. Fourth, there was a growing wave of black militantism and a general feeling of unease all across the South, with local rebellions in Virginia, three in North Carolina, and three in Louisiana just in 1830 until spring of 1831. The federal government was in a high state of readiness, and military forces had been stationed in New Orleans and Fort Monroe. Fifth, there was at this time the vocal formation of a radical wing, the abolitionist wing, within the anti-slavery movement and a series of pro-black activism being done by integrated but largely white societies. A college for black people was proposed to be built in New Haven, Connecticut, but opposed by the mayor and the well-to-do of the city, and the project was abandoned. Also, Virginia was rewriting its state constitution at the convention. I don't have time to go into why, but their old one was having a lot of issues, so they decided to throw it out and write a new one. There was not any amount of anti-slavery agitation at the convention. The issue at hand was actually that male suffrage should be universal instead of based on property. It was more anti-planter than anti-slavery. There was a single proposal made that might be interpreted as anti-slavery of the gradualist school, but nothing came of it. Some slaves nonetheless maintained hope that some form of emancipation might come about. Last, we have a wave of repressive legislation coming out of the Virginia state legislature in the months preceding the conflict. For example, on April 7, 1831, a law stating, quote, All meetings of free Negroes or mulattoes at any schoolhouse, church, meeting house, or other place for teaching them reading or writing, either in the day or night, under whatsoever pretext, shall be deemed and considered as an unlawful assembly. All free black people currently in school would be sold into slavery, all future offending free black people would receive no more than 20 lashes, and any white person present would be fined $50, $1,625 today, and receive two months in jail. 
Further, any white person acting as any kind of teacher or facilitator and had received money to do so would be fined no more than $100, 3200 today, and no less than $10, 320 There was also, as a sub-point of this, the publication of and backlash to the Walker pamphlet. So get ready for an explanation of the Walker pamphlet, about which about half of this episode is derived from. The Walker Pamphlet, or the Walker Appeal, was written by David Walker, born in Wilmington, North Carolina, September 28, 1785, to a free black woman and a slave father who died a few months before his birth. He left the South at a young age, saying, quote, If I remain in this bloody land, I will not live long. As true as God reigns, I will be avenged for the sorrow which my people have suffered. This is not the place for me, no, no. I must leave this part of the country. It will be a great trial for me to live on the same soil where so many men are in slavery. Certainly I cannot remain where I must hear their chains continually, and where I must encounter the insults of their hypocritical enslaver. Go, I must. He lived a poor student activist's life in Boston and published his appeal in 1829 to the outrage of slaveholders. The Appeal or its full title, Walker's Appeal in four articles, together with a preamble to the colored citizens of the world, but in particular, and very expressly, to those of the United States of America, was quite short, about 50 pages, a preamble in four articles, and due to its short size, I recommend that you read it on your own. I'll just include a few selections. The preamble begins with, quote, my dearly beloved brethren and fellow citizens, having traveled over a considerable portion of these United States, and having, in the course of my travels, taken the most accurate observations of things as they exist, the result of my observations has warranted the full and unshaken conviction that we, colored people of the United States, are the most degraded, wretched, and abject set of beings that ever lived since the world began, and I pray God that none like us ever may live again until the time shall be no more. They tell us of the Israelites in Egypt, the Helots in Sparta, and of the Roman slaves, whose sufferings under those ancient and heathen nations were, in comparison with ours, under this enlightened and Christian nation, no more than a cipher. Or in other words, those heathen nations of antiquity had but little more among them than the name and form of slavery, while wretchedness and endless miseries were reserved, apparently in a file, to be poured out upon our fathers, ourselves, and our children by Christian Americans. Article 1 begins with a recognition that while the enslaved black people in America were one of many oppressed peoples in world history, along with indigenous Americans, the Irish, the Jews, and, quote, the inhabitants of the islands of the sea, black people in the U.S. suffered a unique kind of oppression in human history. Walker quotes the Bible, noting how the people of Israel were better treated under the heathen pharaoh than black people were treated by the, quote, enlightened Christians of America. Most notably, that at no point, quote, the Egyptians heaped the insupportable insult upon the children of Israel by telling them that they were not of the human family. Can the whites deny this charge? Have they not, after having reduced us to the deplorable condition of slaves under their feet, held us up as descending originally from tribes of monkeys or orangutans? Oh my god, I appeal to every man of feeling, is this not insupportable? Is it not heaping the most gross insult upon our miseries, because they have got us under their feet and we cannot help ourselves? He quotes Thomas Jefferson, who did say on many occasions that the condition of black people in the United States was, quote, not their condition but nature. Article 2 of the appeal goes more into detail on this Jefferson quote, explaining the obvious in hindsight but then revolutionary idea that the ignorance, his words, of enslaved black people in the U.S. was due to the conditions in which they were forcibly held. He's writing this in 1829, and it would take scientists and sociologists nearly a century to reach the same conclusion. It was generally understood by nearly everyone that slavery was the natural condition of black Africans, and that enslavement was a fundamentally neutral and amoral action, and as evidence of this, one must look no further than the allegedly wretched state of enslaved black people in the U.S. The wretched state was seen as the antecedent for slavery, not a product of it. Article 3 talks about the, quote, wretchedness in consequence of the preachers of the religion of Jesus Christ. Which sounds a bit odd on paper, but he's referring to the corruption that the churches of his time and place faced, having been subsumed into what later thinkers would call the ideological superstructure of the society, intended to maintain the economic condition, slavery. 
Again, he refers to the written history, how in many instances preachers refused to proselyte among black populations, and how slave patrols would break up religious assemblies of, quote, colored people. Historically, the reason for this was that the prohibition coming from the medieval era on Christians enslaving Christians could be subverted by not baptizing Africans. He quotes Bible passages which clearly state Jesus Christ is the Lord of all, and that the white American Christian ministers are in a state of sin for not preaching to the enslaved black people. Walker gets a bit fire and brimstone here, saying that, unless you speedily alter your course, you and your country are gone, for God Almighty will tear up the very face of this earth. Will not that very remarkable passage of scripture be fulfilled on Christian Americans? Hear it, Americans! He that is unjust, let him be unjust still, and be which is filthy, let him be filthy still, and he that is righteous, let him be righteous still, and he that is holy, let him be holy still. Which is Revelations 12.11. Article 4 goes against colonizationalism, which was uh, the then popular idea of abolishing slavery by deporting all of the, at the time, 2.3 million black people living in the United States. Walker calls it a white supremacist hoax and speaks in favor of immediate and universal emancipation without compensation. Walker nears the end with an exhortation. I do declare that one good black man can put to death six white men, but that if you commence, do not trifle, for they will not trifle with you. As historian James B. Stewart puts it in his book Holy Warriors, quote, as Walker saw it, whites had betrayed the spirit of the American Revolution. African Americans alone understood the stark alternatives of liberty or death. The pamphlet concludes with a final warning that the Americans may be as vigilant as they please, but they cannot be vigilant enough for the Lord. Neither can they hide themselves where he will not find and bring them out. Walker had the pamphlet published, and with knowledge of networks of communication and escape crisscrossing the South, Walker's appeal circulated along the Underground Railroad and across the South, from Charleston to Savannah to New Orleans, it got everywhere. Now, one can imagine the outrage that the slaveholders that nearly completely constituted Southern state legislatures had at this pamphlet. Georgia, Louisiana, North Carolina, they all passed laws specifically mentioning Walker's appeal to prevent its spread. The Georgian law specifically stipulated a 40-day quarantine of all vessels carrying free black people in order to search the boat to find copies, and made it a capital offense to circulate, quote, pamphlets of evil tendency among our domestics, their words, and made it illegal to teach any black person to read or write. In North Carolina, it was made illegal to sell or in any way exchange, quote, firearms, powder or shot or lead, to a slave, or even in a slave's presence without explicit permission from their owner, the offending white to be fined $100, and any free black person to be lashed 39 times. Laws were further passed in North Carolina forbidding the marriage of free black people and whites, and prohibiting a free black person from cohabiting with an enslaved black person. Anyone in any way, quote, exciting insurrection, conspiracy, or resistance in the slaves or free negroes, was on their first strike to be pilloried, whipped, and imprisoned for a year, and to be executed on their second. North Carolina also forbade teaching slaves to read or write, math was fine, and giving slaves books or pamphlets. Fines and punishments were increased for aiding runaway slaves, policy for calling out militia to stop runaway slaves was provided for in seven counties in North Carolina, Free black people also had serious curtailments of civil liberties, restricting commercial activity to their county of residence, requiring commercial licenses, stipulating emancipated black people had to leave the state within 90 days of emancipation and the passage of the law, and any free black person who left North Carolina for more than 90 days was never allowed to return. Further, any ship carrying free black people had to quarantine for 30 days. That's an extremely long list, and that's just North Carolina. Every southern state, and every county in every southern state, enacted similar and even more restrictive laws against free and enslaved black people in the five years leading up to Nat Turner's rebellion. Finally, in 1830, the author of the pamphlet, David Walker, was found dead of unknown causes in his used clothing store in Boston. Make of that what you will. Now we are nearing the revolt proper. It must be said that, unavoidably, there is a lack of good, reliable primary sources on the subject. One of the most notorious primary sources, the Confessions of Nat Turner, from which much information, and all of the information on Turner's life comes, are known to be unreliable. 
of the two parties of the conflict, most of the rebels were illiterate, and there are very few written accounts, and for the other party, largely the local newspapers in and around Southampton County, they get basically every important fact wrong from the very beginning. The exact number of rebels and the exact number of victims, regardless of race, is really unknown. In Apthaker's own words, there is unanimity on two things, and only on two things. First, all agree that it took place, or at least started, in Southampton County, Second, that the leader was Nat Turner. So who was this man? 1800 was a very momentous year, it being the year John Brown was born, that Gabriel's revolt happened in Virginia, that Denmark Vesey purchased his freedom, that Napoleon became first consul and crossed the Alps and beat the Austrians at Marengo, and that Thomas Jefferson and Aaron Burr tied for president. And on October 2nd of 1800, Nat Turner was born into slavery. According to his wanted poster, at age 31, he was either 5'6 or 5'8, between 150 and 160 pounds, of a bright complexion, but, quote, not a mulatto. He had a broad build, flat nose, large eyes, broad flat feet, knock kneed of a, quote, brisk and active gait, he had had a mustache and a small beard. He wore scars on one of his temples, the back of his neck, and on his right arm near the wrist. The way he got his scars varies depending on the beliefs of the writer. The abolitionist William Lloyd Garrison said he received them from one of the three masters he had in his life, and the Richmond Inquirer, who absolutely despised his guts, says that he got them in fights with other black people and one from a mule kick. A contemporary notes that he was, quote, never owing a dollar, never uttering an oath, never drinking intoxicating liquors, and never committing a theft. He was very intelligent and rational. He could read and write, although he did not know how or when he learned to do so. He was, moreover, possessed of a revolutionary spirit and very religious. His exact religious beliefs are hard to pin down, but many call him a Baptist for his persistent belief in baptism by full immersion. An exhorter for sure, many records also call him a preacher, although it is certain he never attended a seminary. Aptheker asserts, along with many others, that Turner's motivation was not revenge. Many contemporary accounts and a good deal of historiography states that in order of most to least common, First, that his motivation was unknown, second, that it was plunder, and third, that it was liberty. Local newspapers at first said the motive was unclear, as though a slave rebellion could have an unclear motive, later saying that he was a bandit, but as time went on and the rebellion became a history and not current events, the consensus has been that the objective of the Turner Rebellion was obviously to free themselves from slavery, so no matter which newspapers or contemporary sources you read, just keep that in mind. At first, this was antagonistically, to blame the rebellion on abolitionist agitation. The governor, John Floyd, blamed the rebellion on, quote, Negro preachers and northern abolitionists. A niece of George Washington personally blamed William Lloyd Garrison, who had only begun publication of The Liberator earlier that year. Garrison himself pointed out that he was a pacifist and that The Liberator had, quote, not a single white or black subscriber south of the Potomac, although he was very supportive of the rebellion. Obviously, Walker's appeal had some form of influence, if not on Turner himself, than on the rebels who joined him, but Nat Turner himself never framed it that way. Turner always said that his motivation was religious. In Confessions, he states that he ran away from his master and lived in the wilderness for 30 days, at which point he received a revelation that, quote, On the 12th of May, 1828, I heard a loud noise in the heavens, and the spirit instantly appeared to me and said that the serpent was loosened, and that Christ had laid down the yoke he had borne for the sins of men, and that I should take it on and fight against the serpent, for the time was fast approaching when the first should be last and the last should be first. For this reason, most contemporary accounts, both for and against the revolt, call Nat Turner a prophet. According to the Confession, which I will remind is not an unbiased source, he called himself a prophet. Turner waited for a sign, and he got the solar eclipse of February 12th, 1831, and chose the 4th of July as the date for the revolution. But he was sick on that day and waited for another sign, which came in the form of an atmospheric disturbance that made the sky turn green on the 13th of August. He gathered a group of free and enslaved black people who wore red bandanas around their neck as a symbol. Turner was the last one to arrive at the meeting, and Aptheker notes, he seemed to have appreciated the value of a dramatic entrance. 
the group collectively decided to revolt on Sunday afternoon, August 21st, 1831, and the group numbered 60 to 80 members. And later court records indicate at least four were boys, at least five were free black people, and at least one woman named Lucy participated. He spoke to the different attendants, asking them how they found the meeting, uh, what they were willing to do to obtain their freedom, and just before the revolt started, he made his speech concluding with, quote, Remember that ours is not a war for robbery nor to satisfy our passions. It is a struggle for freedom. Ours must be deeds, not words. Then let us away to the scene of action. This quote is probably not Turner's exact words, but it definitely captures the core message. It needs to be made clear here that Turner's motive was not plunder, although it may have been some of his followers, but there have been profiteers in every social movement in all of history. The revolt did not last long. It started in the countryside, and the 60 to 80 rebels went from house to house, killing plantation owners as well as their families. For obvious reasons, it is often reported that most of the victims were women and children. Certainly, non-combatants were killed, and how many non-combatants are included in the 55 to 65 white casualties of the revolt is unknown, and likely always will be. It also must be noted that it is likely that Turner went out of his way to make sure poor whites were not attacked. After 40 hours of rebellion, largely due to the lack of good weapons and ammunition by the rebels and the inability to capture the county seat, then called Jerusalem but now called Cortland, had Turner captured it with its store of arms and ammunition, the rebellion could have lasted for days, if not weeks. After fighting in the countryside plantations for all Sunday night and Monday morning, Turner arrived near the Parker Plantation, and some of his followers went there to recruit Parker's slaves against Turner's advice. Turner waited for them, but grew impatient and went to retrieve this detachment with most of his force. They were attacked at this point by probably 18 white militiamen, and the body of rebels was largely broken up. And after the limited raiding, the revolt was suppressed on Tuesday the 23rd by three companies of federal troops with cannons. 48 rebels were captured, nearly all of them. 17 were executed immediately, four free black rebels were sent to trial, of which three were hanged, eight were transported to Liberia. In total, at least 20 were hanged. Turner himself avoided capture until October 30. He was found guilty on November 5th, where Judge Jeremiah Cobb sentenced him to be, quote, hanged by the neck until you are dead, 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 and may the Lord God have mercy on your soul. We know from the county records that 52 total rebels were tried, and the number who escaped to any degree will likely be unknown forever. Nat Turner's confessions were allegedly recorded on November 10th, and in the historian Aptiker's words, quote, On November 11th, 1831, Nat Turner went to his death, calmly and apparently unafraid, in the city of Cortland, then known as Jerusalem, in Southampton County, Virginia. But though Jeremiah Cobb had exclaimed, Dead! Thrice! And even as he had so exclaimed three hundred times, Nat then, at the moment of his execution, only began to live. Immediately after the rebellion was suppressed, there was a wave of confusion, more than anything else, and with that confusion came wave upon wave of recriminatory violence. Nobody knows, and likely never will, how many free and enslaved black people were killed in the summer and fall of 1831, but it was easily double the number of whites killed by the rebels. Every weekly newspaper for months all across the entire South contains at least one article along the lines of Slave owner suspects of slaves of planning revolt. Slave owner assembles slave patrol. Sue slaves and freedmen killed. For months. We will never know how many of these alleged would-be rebels actually intended that, or if the deaths were simply retaliatory, but the White South collectively lost their minds when Lant Turner rebelled. The law was amply used as a cudgel against free and enslaved black people, and honestly there were so many restrictions passed in such a short period of time I had to make the following chart noting the similarities between all the different states. You'll notice a lot of recurring themes here, mostly commercial restrictions, but also gun control being passed against free black people. But the Turner Revolt, and the legislative and violent backlash to it, caused the opposite effect in the North. William Lloyd Garrison said, Insurrections are the natural and consequent productions of slavery. Experiences prove this in all ages and in all nations where slavery has existed. Slavery ought to be, must be, and shall be abolished in these United States. 
Turner had a substantial impact on John Brown as well, who said, quote, Nat Turner, with 50 men, held Virginia five weeks. The same number, well organized and armed, can shake the system out of the state. It is often said that in the wake of the Turner Revolt, all the anti-slavery societies in the South closed, and a thousand anti-slavery societies in the North were founded. There was a fertile hotbed of social activism going around in the North, and the Turner Revolt was the catalyst for the foundation of a new brand of anti-slavery, which we will cover next time. Thanks for watching. If you liked it, give it a like, and if you didn't, dislike. In the comments, you can leave suggestions for special episodes, any question you may have, and whatever else you'd like to put there. I'd like, I'd like to especially thank my patrons, my dad and Hestia. If you want to join their illustrious ranks, the link to my Patreon is in the description. Please sure to share this video with a history buff in your life, and I'll see you next time. I'll close with a quote from G.W. Williams, writing in 1883, who said that among Southern black people, quote, women have handed down the tradition to their children, and the prophet Nat is still marching on.